now um, due, to the, due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, as of March, end of March, our president signed into law a $2 trillion stimulus law, the CARES Act, which also provides funding for real, uh, small businesses throughout the nation. So we've identified three of the top and most relevant programs that we will be discussing today. They're the ones that have provided the most confusion for most people. And we'll be discussing the small business debt relief, the PPP, which is also known as the Paycheck Protection Program, and the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. You may hear, her, hear us refer to it as EIDL for short. So if you're a small business or a nonprofit, whether you're an independent contractor or self-employed, we'll have several options for you to choose from for assistance options. And on to today's um, presenter, we'd like to present Harut Yadalian from Privileged Investment Group. Harut has been helping businesses for numerous years now access government loans, um, different types of assistance, grants, and he's been in direct communication with the SBA, which is the Small Business Administration, to ensure that all the content that we provide for you today is up to date and the most accurate information that is currently available. He's been in contact with a lot of the key directors of the SBA, so um, suffice it to say, he really knows his stuff. And another presenter for today will be Vahan Papian of RSVP Tax and Advisors Incorporated. Vahan will be touching upon some tax related and accounting questions later on. Um, I'd also like to remind all of you, I'm not sure if you noticed the chat, to go ahead and submit your questions into the questions box. Um, just um, something from, if you can just please make sure to submit the questions that are relevant to the topic that we are discussing. It'll help us kind of stay organized and make sure that we get to as many questions as possible. So if we're referring to a particular slide and it's the EIDL slide, go ahead and type in your questions regarding that slide. Perhaps um, hold off on the PPP questions until a little bit later on when we get to that slide. Um, in addition, we're live streaming on Facebook, so we'll try to get to the questions on there as well. Um, and thank you for joining us from there also. And without further ado, it's all yours, Harut. Thank you, Nare. I actually um, uh, forgot to push the slides forward, so now I know it works. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'd like to join Nare in thanking all of you on joining us this afternoon. And happy Easter to all. Uh, we know you had other things to do. I don't know about going out of your house, but definitely other things to do with your family and enjoying Easter. So. Um, thank you for those of you who've joined us, and we will try to do the best to provide you with the information we can. Um, you are here uh, seeking for your own businesses uh, and self. So, as Nada mentioned, uh, these programs came out um, with the CARES Act, and due to the current uh, economic disaster um, and the issues we're facing with COVID-19, and so uh, through the SBA, um, the government has released, uh, you know, some of these fundings that are available for various businesses, small businesses, as they identify it. So we've identified three of these, um, I guess, major programs, if you will, that most people seem to have the most confusion around and need the most information. And uh, the one thing I'd like to uh, also share with you before we go forward is that this is, in fact, just for informational purposes only. Uh, do not consider anything I say or we say, any of us share with you at this time. Uh, you know, to be any type of advice. It's not legal advice, it's not tax advice, it's not financial advice. And those of you who are uh, maybe a little more aware of the current environment, especially as it pertains to these programs, you know that it is always subject to change, especially things change daily, and the new, new program guidelines may come out. However, we've done as much research as we can um, based on the information we have and uh, being in contact with the resources that we have. Uh, to be able to share with you the most up-to-date information. Okay, and having said that, at the end, we will provide you with an email um, that you can share your email. And for those of you who also registered, um, you know, we will forward you the resources and links. And I also like to remind with the questions, we will do our best to uh, answer all the questions that we uh, receive on any of the forms uh, that are showing this live. Uh, just know they would assist us if you just send in your questions as we move along with um, the program and so it pertains to that section. And then at the end, we are gonna have a general Q&A and we will try to answer more questions at that time. We will not have all the answers, um, but we have we do have a lot of information. And uh, the best example I can give, which I gave uh, on our uh, last, we last webinar is, I was on a uh, you know uh, call with um, 
different businesses, lenders, and the SBA folks. And even they gave examples where they had questions, they sent it to four different regional offices around the nation, and they received four different answers. So this is very fluid, things are changing. Um, if we know the answer, we will provide it. If we don't, um, then we will say we don't know it, uh, and we will try to provide you a resource where you can continue to check. All right, so having said that, let's get started. Um, and at any time, not a, uh, feel free to chime in if I forget something, um, or if a question comes up at a point that we can um, you know, try to answer at that point. So the first one, I think it's the least confusing um, and probably the simplest of all of them. And it's not simple by any means, but it does, uh, it does have the least amount of information and the least confusion. However, it probably is the program most people, most businesses um, have not heard about yet. It's called the Small Business Debt Relief Program. So what this is, is it's um, again, part of the CARES Act package and it's to provide the relief to small businesses. However, uh, one caveat is that it's existing non-disaster um, with existing non-disaster loans. And some of these uh, eligible SBA products, uh, they're called the 7A, the 504, and a microloans product. So if you have currently an SBA um, loan uh, and that fall, you know, fall within one of these uh, three products, you can call your lender that is servicing these loans or you know, whatever the name of the company bank is on your current mortgage statement um call them and let them know you would like to apply for this program and by law they should uh waive your six months of loan principal interest and fees and the difference between waived and deferred is that you don't have to pay it back it's waived it's you know it doesn't have anything to do with your credit if you forget to pay there's no, no time that you need to pay this um so an example someone gave was they called their bank told them about this program and the bank told them we've never heard of this program, please provide proof. The proof is on the SBA site. So if you're one of these people who ran into this or uh, you know, you go to a bank or your lender and you call them and they said, we've never heard about it, um, you can definitely refer to the SBA because it's on there. Uh, it's part of the guidelines and legislation. Now, the second prong of this is uh, for new SBA non-disaster loans, as they have uh, described it, that are issued prior to September 27th or prior to September 2020, can also qualify for this uh, six month loan principal interest and waiver. Okay. Um, can we also kind of point out to everyone where one can, a borrower can go to apply for these benefits? Yes. So uh, going back to the original point is if uh, you're not sure where to go, um, one, it should be the bank or the lender that's uh, currently servicing your loan. But if off the top of your head you can't remember, or you're not sure if uh, you, know, you have a loan that's um, maybe different from one of these products, for example, you know, your monthly mortgage statement that you receive from them to pay your loan, give them a call, look at that, you know, look to see what company it is. And even if on the form, it, or the statement, it doesn't have the program or identify it, call them, ask them, let them assist you. Uh, the one thing they have uh, shared with us is that um, do not assume and do not expect that um, these will be covered for you or that, uh, you know, your lenders will automatically waive these. You must take the initiative yourself to call and um, we all understand, we've all probably experienced it if we tried, long waiting times when you do call. Um, so another thing you may wanna do is also email them because it seems like a lot of these institutions are more responsive to emails um, and uh, very uh, thin on resources when it comes to answering calls. Good question. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I'll go on to the next one. We're all good for now. Thank you. So the second part of, uh, or the second program is uh, the injury economic, the, excuse me, the economic injury disaster loan. Uh, I'll be referring it to as IDLE or also known as IDLE. Uh, this loan is, I'll kind of do this uh, points in reverse. It is a maximum of up to $2 million and it is a loan. However, uh, the part that seems to be confusing to a lot of folks is the difference between you know, the cash advance that you may receive up to $10,000 and the $2 million, they are the same thing. What it is, is um, currently as it stands and has changed, is um, when you apply for this loan, and I'll, I'll show you where you can apply if, if you're not already familiar, uh, it allows you to select an option that says, may I get a cash advance of $10,000. This amount, whatever you receive, and that's why we bolded and capitalized up to, is uh, actually the part that may be forgiven. 
Um, and I say maybe because it's not guaranteed, but the actual uh, loan itself, anything, um, any other amount up to $2 million that is granted uh, is an actual loan. It is not a, um, it is not a forgiven portion. Okay. And so you may go directly to this uh, website, um, which I will show you now to apply if you haven't already applied. Was I on mute or did you guys uh, not? Could you hear me? I didn't hear you, but now okay. I hear you fine. Okay, so um, this is the application. If you guys can see this uh, on my screen, I'm sharing a couple of windows here. So just to let you know, um, let me know if you can't see something. But this is the application if you haven't applied. And this is the website and we will be sharing this as a resource. It's um, so I'll just click. Most businesses are going to qualify under 500 employees. And then these are some of the eligibility factors that you will check in order to be able to qualify for this loan. And then once you click continue, this is the one part I wanted to show you. And I'm not going to go through the entire application, but the part I want to show you that we will go over again later is um, it does pertain to um, not just small businesses, you know under 500 with EIN numbers, but you can also be a sole proprietor, independent contractor with an SSN. And the organization types, for example, uh, you can be an LLC, S Corp, again, sole prop. Um, you can have a limited partnership, independent contractor, and I myself am not sure what other is, but they do give you a lot of options. Uh, so the thing to take away from this is definitely apply if you're not sure and allow them to, um, you know, to tell you if uh, you qualify or not. So I'm gonna share my screen again if we go back. I think it takes me back to the original first screen. Um, I will have to adjust it, give me a second. No, it went back. Okay, any questions on this uh, slide, Nare? Or I think we're good, right? If everybody wants to see the application. Um, for now, we're good. We have quite a few on idle, but I'll kind of save them for a little bit later on. Okay, maybe as we go forward, it'll answer it or as we move forward with the slides. Um, so for idle business and entities uh, with substantial, substantial economic injury, it is now open to all 50 states. When this first came about, not all states had declared an, a state of emergency or, or counties, but as I understand it, and that is uh, listed on their site, it's for all 50 states. Again, eligible businesses, like I showed you before, it's uh, fewer than 500 employees. Um, small businesses, private nonprofit organizations, sole prop, uh, independent contractors, self-employed, etc. Uh, eligible applications uh, should have been, excuse me, eligible applicants, businesses should have been in operation um, on January 31st when the, this, the health crisis was announced. So that is uh, something to take away. One of the questions, uh, you know, that came up was, what, well, what if it was February 1st or whatever it may be? And the response they give is, you know, go ahead and try it. All that can happen is a denial. Um, or you can have a conversation when they contact you. Okay. I'm also looking at my notes to see if I had anything I want to share. So but the next one. An example, sorry, before you continue. Can you give an example of what a private nonprofit organization can be? Sure. So um, as uh, they define it, it could be a, a 501C, D, or E, and, uh, and uh, the subsections, subsections that apply to um, those. Not an NGO, in other words. Um, and maybe Vahan may have more information on that uh, now or later. But uh, that's what I've seen. So what we did is we kind of um, mirrored what they uh, have been stating which is um, you know, private non nonprofit organizations uh, and specifically that fall within the, those three. Okay, and a few more questions coming in. Um, for all of the loan programs, um, I guess for now we can refer to the idle. If I have a corporation and I am the only employee of the corporation, am I considered a small business with one employee or self-employed? So um, that was a question that actually came up uh, on a recent call um, late yesterday actually in the evening, 
and um, the way they, uh, and again, this is their information. I keep saying they, I'm not uh, you know, letting you know how you should file your application, but don't put zero. If you're the only person, put one because you, you, you are the owner, you are the employee, if you will. So you should put one. And um, I'll go over it again later, but something that's a good point to bring up, it reminds me is uh, up to a couple of days ago, it wasn't very clear as to how they calculate the $10,000 and there's still further clarification needed as to how they really calculate uh, and um, grant your loan. But the $10,000 as they know, as they uh, have shared, it seems to be um, directly related to the number of employees you put on in that line. So for example, when you're applying, if you put one, most likely that up to cash advance portion is gonna be $1,000. If you put five, it will make it most likely maybe $5,000. If you put 30, it could only go up to $10,000. So that is the maximum you can receive as a cash advance. Um, so that's a good question. Okay, uh, so I think maybe some of these points may answer your questions as well. We already discussed that it's $2 million maximum that you can receive. Um, the interest rate is a fixed per annum interest rate for profit companies, the businesses we discussed and the eligible ones. And then if you're a private, pro um, it says you're not for profit, but private uh, nonprofit organization, your interest rate is actually 2.75%. And these are not to exceed uh, a term of 30 years. Uh, for anyone here available with um, commercial lending or loans in general, this is an excellent uh, rate that they're offering for businesses and uh, a great um, term for 30 years. And we have some of the examples below that I'll go over. Uh, some of the uses for this loans, um, for, for example, for fixed expenses, accounts payable, um, your insurance mortgage interest apply to this, um, payroll and other general operating expenses. And they have shared that you may project up to a year of damage as a result of the pandemic. Uh, now, something worth noting, and we'll go over again later, is any portion of this loan, including that $10,000 that may be a grant, um, if it's used for same purposes as the PPP, then um, you could only use it for one or there'll be a certain deduction from the PPP or it'll be refinanced into the PPP, which we will go over later. Uh, but um, you may still use it, but you can't you know, kind of double up and use for the same payroll purposes for both loans. Doesn't mean you should apply. You can apply for both, but you should only, um, you can only use it for one. So the cash advance up to ten thousand uh, dollars. Again, this was something that has been out there. I myself don't know anyone. They haven't mentioned anyone, but the understanding was that you may receive a cash advance even if you're denied, and the amount you receive may be uh, forgiven even if you did not receive a loan. Uh, however, uh, from my understanding, and at least uh, in sharing or some of the people we've been uh, assisting or talking to, uh, none of them have yet received um, a cash advance when or if they were denied. Okay, and something to share that uh, they shared, but I haven't seen it in writing or I'm, I may have missed it. If you're denied for some reason, and uh, I haven't heard of anyone getting denied, it could be for credit purposes or credit reasons, you actually have six months to appeal. Um, so they really wanna work with you because circumstances may have changed. Um, you know, so they, they, they really want to be able to assist small businesses, okay? And just to go over the calculations uh, to give you some insight on why these uh, interest rates are so low and beneficial for those that may need it, is um, the $25,000 at 30 years is 116 a month, where a 50,000 at the same term and rate is about 232, and 100 is at 463 a month. Anything you'd like me to touch on now that you? I was just going to interject and say, can we also maybe touch upon what other uses of idle there are? And then after that, we have quite a few more questions that we can get into. But I do have some questions about property owners, real estate. So maybe we can also touch upon that. So for property owners, um, the discussion uh, has been around that property owners would qualify on this idle um, if they have losses of rent. And um, again, the difference between the cash advance portion or the loan, but you can apply for the loan um, for idle as opposed to a PPP is is what they've explained. And one of the differences, if I forgot to mention it between the two loans, and I'll say it again when we go to PPP, is that the idle you're applying directly with the SBA. That is the website that I just showed on the screen. So you have to go apply. Can somebody assist you? Of course, 
but banks and lenders and brokers and whoever they may be, they can probably only assist you, but they can't <clears throat> submit the loan for you. Okay, so that's uh, something worth noting. So when you actually do this, uh, you'll be de dealing directly with the SBA, their loan officers, their case managers, um, and not a particular lender because they are the ones who will be directly funding this for you. And then perhaps can we kind of go into the cash advance, how it's, um, and also the, um, um, the 10K portion, the cash advance, how it's calculated? So the 10K, I think I mentioned it, but I'll mention again, uh, what they've been saying the last couple of days as things have been, uh, you know, I guess clearing up a little more, is that that 10K cash advance up to uh, is, it seems to be just solely based on the number of employees you enter on that line, um, or you actually have. So, you know, if you have one, don't enter nine. Um, you know you should enter what is uh, the correct information. But so if you enter one employee, like there was a question before, what I'm, if I'm the sole owner of my business, if you're the only one and you put one employee, the understanding is, uh, the way they've explained it, is you'll have up to $1,000 or $1,000. And, and that's, that's purely how it's calculated. I haven't received any other information that says they base it on anything else. Um, a lot of people also have questions about They've either submitted the app or they want to know how soon can, would they hear back? Um, are they able to check status and those type of questions? <clears throat> so um, when they first submitted the loan, it, you know, the loan you could have submitted when it came out uh, even before March 31st. At that time, it was a really intensive process. There were some hard documents you had to upload, um, probably took three, four hours to get through it and very confusing. Uh, so at that time, the understanding was you, you may receive your cash advance in three days. I don't think anybody received their cash advance in three days, and they still don't. It can take up to three weeks, give or take, for you to receive your response. Um, if the question is, has anyone actually received a response and approval? The answer is yes. Um, and I'm only sharing you know, what they share on the call, but I think they were saying about 30% of idle applications have already been approved. So if you haven't received anything, um, be patient. There is a website. We will email you that you can email them directly. The only uh, thing to note is that when you email this website, which is directly to the SBA to inquire about the status of your loan, and again, this is specific to EIDL, you must have your uh, loan application number in that email, perhaps even the subject line. And if you don't get a response, be patient. Of course, you can always email them again, but this is um, the only place you can really check for the status uh, of EIDL. Also, another thing they mentioned is if you applied before March 31st and uh, you didn't um, you didn't request the $10,000 cash advance because the, the application was very different. It wasn't as simple as this one. And this application online actually gives you an option to select the cash advance at the end. But uh, the old one, I guess, didn't or it was a two-part process. You should reapply. Um, that's what they have said. And something to note about reapplying is every time you apply for either of these loans, you will get an inquiry on your credit. So that is probably the only downside other than being denied. Um, and if you do check your credit often, or if you have a, um, a system that uh, alerts you, you will see that um, you, hit, you had a credit hit. You had a credit inquiry. Um, and then for EIDL, it doesn't really specify on the SBA side how much loan you're applying for. Um, does that happen later on? Do they just, what's the process of that? Say that again. If you can ask me, I was reading one of the notes. On the SBA website, it doesn't specify when you're applying for EIDL, how much of a loan you're applying for. It doesn't have an option for us to um, give any preference. What is the process later on? So yes, one is it doesn't have an option. Uh, you can only put your cost of goods sold, uh, known also as COGS, and then your gross amount um, from 2019, which you take directly from your taxes if you filed it. Um, and then after that, when they receive it, again, they'll base the up to $10,000 based on the number of employees. And then there is no clear guidance as to how they're really um, approving these loans and basing the amounts, but it is an understanding that is based on your employees, uh, the number of employees you have, your credit, and then uh, your income uh, that you had from 2019, but they haven't shared yet as to how they're going to determine the total uh, amount of your loan. However, before your loan is um, funded, you do receive a bunch of emails, actually, 
from the SBA and uh, a meeting, a call to set up with one of the case managers and the SBA loan officers who will go through the application with you, let you know how much you're approved for. And at that time, you do have an option, for example, just, just a number. Uh, if, if you only got approved for 25,000, but you actually need 50, at that time, you can let them know, you know, I want this amount instead of this amount. And that's when uh, they'll work with you. And at that time, when they reach out to you, they'll ask you for all the necessary paperwork that you weren't able to upload because you can't at the time you filed. I, they, I mean, I, I, they probably wouldn't uh, grant your loan um, with this particular application that you're gonna submit without contacting you and having, having you send whatever other information you need, which can include your taxes and other financial documents. So that they'll, they'll be the ones determining the DSBA after review. This is kind of phase one. You get in the system, try to get a cash advance. Phase two, they contact you, ask for documentation to upload or send to them, and uh, at that time, provide you with a, um, an initial approval of your loan if you haven't yet received your uh, $10,000 or up to that advance amount, and then work with you, maybe ask you questions about your current status or whatever it may be. So they'll continue to work with you. Um, regarding trading them, is the same if they have an EIN and a DBA? Um, should they just include the DBA for both? If they have a what? A trade for the trade name, trade name and business name. If they have an EIN, should they use the DBA for both? Um, actually, uh, if Vahan knows, uh, he can answer this. But the way, and I don't know if I'm answering the question correctly or if I heard it correctly, is if you have a business and you have a, a bunch of DBAs. You know, if those DBAs are under that one business, um, you're only applying for um, that one business uh, to include. No, it's just DBA. one DBA, I believe. Okay. Well, even if it's one DBA, but it's just that DBA for that business, you can include your DBA, but um, you're only submitting for one loan, as opposed to if you had multiple businesses with multiple ITN numbers, then you would apply for each of those businesses separately. Oh, John, if if I may, hi everyone. Please. This is Rahan. Have Easter. Um, the way I understand the question, if you're a sole proprietor, if let's say there's no business entity uh, and you have a DBA, uh, that's a good question. There's no clear answer. Uh, the assumption I've made or the position I've taken, but again, it's my personal opinion, uh, is the business is still you personally. So I've wrote down the personal name of the person. And then for the trade name, you put down the trade name. And then for the EIN, you use the EIN. So again, this is my personal approach or personal uh, recommendation I've given, but there's no clear guidance. It's just based on my own judgment. Thank you, Vaughn. And can we go over, um, I believe someone had a question regarding, they've already applied March 31st. Um, can you clarify when we should reapply again for EIDL if they applied in March? So I think the reason they were saying you should reapply if you applied before March 31st was if you didn't, if you applied before March 31st, but you didn't request that $10,000. But if you applied before March 31st, you also requested that $10,000. Maybe, you know, you went through the complete application. There was no confusion and you received the loan application number then the best thing to do is uh, just check with them on the status of your loan, especially if you haven't heard anything by now. And we will be sharing that email um, yeah, at the end of this, the email address you can inquire with uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, do we have an idea how, so basically they will not reject applications without trying to contact us to fix any issues, I guess. Someone has a question regarding what the procedure is going to be. I I don't I don't know. Um, like if, so, the question, as I understand it, so I can repeat it, is I applied for an application um, and they rejected it without anybody contacting me. Correct? Without Something having those lines. Are they going to kind of give us the ability to explain, justify, correct anything, update anything, or is it going to be? Um, just you know completely rejected and move, moved on to the next applicant um 
I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I can't speak to that, but from my understanding and what they've said is um, there aren't too many reasons they're going to deny your application at this point, um, you know, unless you qualify for a very small amount. Um, but even then, it's not a matter of uh, being disqualified. I think credit becomes an issue is the way they explained it. That may be one reason you may be disqualified or rejected. Uh, again, you have that six month appeal period and then the email we share with you, you may also uh, reach out to them if you are denied or even if you just want to check on the status of your loan. But again, please note that um, here's one good example I can give and I think the number even came out yesterday and I'm sharing only information I've received. Uh, so it's like kind of second or third hand. But the SBA um, statistically takes under 100,000 applications per year or processes or funds. In the last three weeks, they've received 500,000. Okay, um, there's no way they have the resources, uh, you know, to handle this. And the fact they are is amazing. And the reason I bring that up is when you email or try to communicate with them, even though it might be very urgent, and I understand that, um, you know, you have to be patient when you uh, send that out. If you don't get it yet, yes, of course, go ahead and email again. But there may be, um, you know, a, a gap between the time you email them and when you actually get a response. Great, thanks, Robert. Okay, um, okay to go on? Yeah, let's, we can go on. And um, just a reminder, we'll also have a general Q&A um, at the end. So if your question didn't get answered, we can also address it later on. The uh, one thing I also like to mention is um, the collateralization of this loan and the difference between this and idle. So the way Dave explained that is for idle, and this is the idle loan, the injury, I keep saying injury, uh, economic injury disaster loan. Uh, if it's under $25,000 that's granted for the loan amount, there is no personal guarantee or co uh, collateral required. If it's over $25,000, they may ask you for a collateral or personal guarantee if you own a home, uh, business assets, uh, and the like. Now, what I've heard from them, heard meaning like this is what they were discussing, was that you know, it's not a means for um, rejecting or denying your application uh, because they'll, you know, they're trying to work with you, but that is what they've stated that they may require a collateral or um, some kind of personal guarantee if you get a loan for idle, specifically for idle only over $25,000. So that's worth noting. Okay. Thank you. So now on to the third um, program, probably the hottest topic of all. And uh, as you know, this program, the PPP, it's a payment protection program. It's, uh, I put payment, but it's actually paycheck protection program. It is as it says it is. It is what it says it is. It's specifically designed to assist uh, eligible, and I, we keep using that word eligible, but eligible small businesses and those that are self-employed um, to keep their employees uh, paid with these loans for the PPP, which can be forgiven. So it's not an automatic forgiveness, and that's why we worded it this way. It is actually a loan, and we'll go over this again uh, during the slides, but it's a loan you get, you receive, which may be forgiven at a certain period of time after you provide proof and documentation. So it's not forgiven when you receive it. Uh, so on April 3rd, this was the first day where um, small businesses, the nonprofits with employees could submit the application. And uh, as of April 10th, yesterday was the first day that uh, self-employed independent contractors, those who received 1099, um, could submit their application. Now, up until yesterday, again, there was a lot of confusion and things may still change, but it, there was um, nobody really knew if there were going to be different uh, applications, different forms required, a whole different program. And I'm referring to yesterday as in those that are self-employed or independent contractors with 1099s. However, we got to yesterday and we got to today and nothing has changed. Um, the application remains the same and I'll try to share with you uh, soon what it looks like. And the process seems to be the same. Now we'll go over the, the potential documents, uh, necessary documents that uh, may potentially be required from the banks or lenders uh, in one of the other slides, but you may not need to provide as much um, if you're a 1099 as the small businesses, uh, but we will go over that. So having said that, if you are self-employed independent contractor, you can officially apply and we will go over where. And if you're a small business a nonprofit with employees, you could have applied starting April 3rd. And there's actually a deadline on this, um, 
the deadline to submit applications is June 30th. And the reason for that is because these funds must be used by June 30th in order for them to be forgiven. Uh, so I know that puts a lot more pressure on those who haven't because that eight week period is between May 1st and June 30th. And that's why everybody's working 24 hours, seven days a week to try to get these out. So as I mentioned before, these two loans, which is the PPP and the IDLE, may be uh, done in conjunction and you can apply for both as long as they're for different uses. However, what if it's for the same use? I'll ask this question because it's a common question. Uh, what if it's for the same use, which is payroll, but um, for the IDLE, you used it in March, and then for the PPP after you received it, you used it in April. And the way they explained it is at that time, you can use it for both, um, you know, you can use both loans because you use it for different months um, and different payrolls. Different payrolls as in, you know, um, well, different months essentially. So, but if, if you were to go and use them for the same period of time, then you cannot use both both loans for payroll specifically, okay, or whatever the other uh, uses are that qualify under the PPP. Um, there's quite a few people that have, I've heard, and we both have heard that have applied for PPP, but they um, they haven't heard anything. And some of them haven't been able to apply because of their banks rejecting because, you know, it's first come, first serve. Is there any recommendation we have for those people? Uh, well, maybe not a recommendation, but we have some information. Um, is uh, That's actually part of the next point. So if anybody else has a question, I'm going to try to cover that. Is any existing and approved SBA lender or bank, um, and I say approved because there were SBA lenders uh, who may not have been doing these products, they actually applied and uh, the SBA was uh, granting these. Why? Because I explained to you, they went from 100,000 to 500,000 in a matter of three weeks. So they really need um, a lot of help. And having said that for these loans specifically, and I'll keep calling it loans, even though it could be forgiven for PPP, you may directly apply. You can actually only, only they can, they being SBA approved lenders and banks uh, can process these loans. And they are the ones who are actually gonna fund you. Um, and then they'll get reimbursed from the SBA. Whereas the idle, the money will come directly from the SBA to you. And so when you're dealing with these loans, you'll be dealing directly with the local, actually it could be national, any one of these uh, lenders or banks. Now we also added a point here because the SBA guidelines and legislation when it came out, and I think again, this goes to assisting the community, they actually uh, added a clause in there that allows third parties, they, they uh, coined it as agents, like loan brokers, um, who may assist in, uh, you know, putting these together for you and submitting to a lender if you go through a loan broker um, that that may be approved with one of these lenders um, or just to maybe assist you and then guide you to a lender or bank that may submit it. So there's a lot of confusion out there. Uh, I can let you know from uh, our company experience, not a lot of lenders or brokers, bankers are working with loans, excuse me, loan brokers, but there are those uh, few who are or were and then they're not accepting applications, those ones anymore. However, it is a good resource. And why it's a good resource is because some banks are only, um, I'll use the word banks, but we'll, you know, we're talking about banks, lenders, uh, kind of the same. Uh, they're not accepting applications unless you have a business account with them. Uh, they're not accepting applications because like Wells Fargo, they actually hit a limit and they have to go back to the treasury to ask for more uh, money. Um, they're not accepting applications until you uh, open a new business account with them or whatever type of account, some, you know, new relationship. Uh, so, and then that's where it, you know, this part of it comes in is you want to uh, have someone within your local community that you may have a relationship with that you can go to and maybe they can guide you to say, okay, well, if you can't go to, you know, Wells or wherever, and I'm not picking on one bank, I'm just stating facts from news. Um, these are your other resources. And so instead of you having to try to call you know, pull up the SBA lender list and call everybody, which you can, and we'll send you that resource too. These are people who may already know, um, look, this is a bank, this is a lender, even outside of California or in LA or in Orange County, wherever it may be, that are still assisting, that are still accepting applications and so forth. So um, that I thought it was worth sharing because uh, there have been a lot of calls and inquiries about even businesses uh, who maybe, you know, weren't rushing at first and now they're worried that funds are going to run out. So they're really looking for a, a resource that can assist them. As far as funds running out, uh, this isn't part of the question, but 
the word is, at least the way they put it, is there's a request for, to add additional $250 billion on top of the $350 billion um, for this program. So we'll see what happens with that, but nothing yet. Anything else, Nade? Um, I think we can... I, I, I know there's plenty, but anything yeah, There's else? always plenty, but we can continue and um, we'll get to the rest of the questions. Okay. Um, I saw one here. I don't know if it's pertaining to me. It says, does my company help? Uh, yes, we have been. Um, we are approved with a couple of folks from the East Coast. Um, and even folks that we're not approved, we just try to be assist um, anyone we can or guide them in the right direction. But everyone is overwhelmed, I can tell you that much. So if you find someone that can help you or knows information, go for it. If the resources you can take from the, lend, the email that we forward, you can also work with um, them too. And something I can share with you, um, I mean, I don't know any of these people as far as where they are and so forth, but everyone is really working around the clock. Uh, you know, I'm getting emails from the people in these agencies at 11 p.m., midnight, 10 p.m., answering questions that we may have that we're sending to them, because ultimately this is for all of us, right? You know, this is for the businesses, this is for the communities and so forth. So um, it may be frustrating and it is for all of us, but all of us are in the same um, basket, if you will. All right. Um, so I may have answered some of these questions, and if I did, I apologize, but we'll, you know, it's okay to go over it again. Businesses and entities must have been in operation on February 15th. Um, if there's a question about, let me write this down so I can go over it. So seasonal borrowers and how this may be different, uh, not if there's a question about that, I will go over it because that does come up, is uh, eligible businesses kind of similar to or identical to idle. Uh, small business entities, 501c3 uh, nonprofit organizations, sole props, independent contractors, eligible self-employed, 1099 folks. Um, now, loan term and size, the, again, here's where the differences lie between the two loans also. This loan, you can get up to $10 million. Uh, you can only have one PPP loan um, per business, and I think that's what we're discussing, and if Vahan has any more input, please uh, share now or later, is, you know, if you have one business, but, you know, DBA under it doesn't necessarily mean you can apply for all your DBAs. Or if you're an individual with a DBA, um, you can apply for both yourself and the DBA for whatever it is if you're just using your social. So um, they say we limit to one PPP. And if, again, if you're using portions of idle for the PPP purpose as well, payroll or whatever it may be, then you'll either be forgiven if it was part of the cash advance or you can actually refinance into this loan. And the other difference between the calculation and actually the good news about this is very, well, I take that back. It's not very clear, but it's much more clear as to how these loan amounts are being calculated. And that is that you may receive up to 2.5 2 times your average monthly payroll, okay? And uh, how would you calculate your average monthly payroll? For example, you take, and I'll use this ex example and explain why. You take somebody who receives $120,000, you divide it by 12, it's $10,000. Uh, and not a, you know, fact check me if my math is off here, then you won't multiply that monthly $10,000 by two and a half times. So now you have $25,000 of loan that you, you can apply for. Um, however, the cap is only per employee um, to receive a hundred that, that receives, per employee, you could only calculate the average up to $100,000 annually. So for the example I provided, which was $120,000, so it doesn't matter if they make 105, 130, 200, you could only go up to that $100,000 cash equivalent for that um, employee. What I have, and I was talking to Vahan about this, uh, you know, I'm weary about mentioning this, um, but it's, it may be worth uh, checking with the lender if they've had it, is they further clarified in their final interim rule, which came out a few days ago from the SBA and the Treasury, was that they separated the understanding between cash equivalent of what somebody receives in their uh, paycheck for the employees, and then the benefits that could be rolled into that or added to that um, to get to that certain amount. So in other words, you may have only been applying for your you know, cash equivalent payroll portion, but yet here's this other amount you could have gotten a much larger loan for. Okay, so another thing to note, I mentioned all the people that can help you where you can apply. It uh, doesn't matter who helps you, doesn't matter where you go, there is no application fee to the borrower. One, the individual you go to, the business, the lender, the, the bank, they we, anybody cannot actually charge you. And then there are also the loan fees and a lot of that uh, is, has been waived by the SBA. So any payments, any commissions, anything that 
may potentially be made by the individuals or banks, lenders assisting you, will only come from the SBA through the lender, you know, uh, to whomever. So, and I can also share with you uh, what they've offered is so minimal, you know, consider what everybody is doing a community service, um, but that's not, you don't necessarily care about it. It's just, it's a, it's a good thing to know. And how much time do they have to accept uh, the law? Uh, that's a good question that was clarified a couple days ago uh, um, and actually thank you I didn't talk about that I'm idle for the PPP when you receive your approval you have 10 days to accept that amount and then after you accept it they average about five to six days by the time you can actually receive it the funds okay so you must act fast unlike the idle and this is where you know everyone is encouraged to apply not necessarily by me but overall is because the idle you have until 12 months after you receive the approval to accept it. What does that mean? That means, and I'm just using random numbers here, if you get $50,000 loan approved from idle and you don't accept it, but you say, you know, I'm not sure right now, so it's pending, but then you get a PPP loan that you use until June 30th and now it's over. And let's say, you know, this pandemic is still going on or business are affected, whatever it may be, then you can go back and now receive this loan. But if you didn't apply, right, then you don't know what you could have gotten. Now, if you didn't apply, does that mean, and I'm talking about if you didn't apply for the idle loan, does that mean it's over? No. The other part of idle, different from the PPP program, is you actually have until middle of December 2020 to approve, excuse me, to apply for the idle loan. But I, I think it's important to note that both these programs um, have limited funding. Uh, I'd be shocked if there's somebody who applies in December and there's still funding left but anything is possible. So that's why everybody should try to apply now, regardless if you need you know, either loan. And the reason, again, the only, I guess, downfall is you're gonna get an inquiry or a hit on your credit, and it's gonna be denied if it is denied. Um, but if it is accepted for the idle, you have 12 months of this loan that you can go back and not only renegotiate to get more if you want it, but also accept at any time at such a low fixed rate. And then the PPP, you only have 10 days. Now. One thing on the idle, and I apologize for going back on this, but I think it's uh, worth noting since we're talking about it right now, the idle loan can actually be deferred up to 12 months from the time you receive the funding. Okay, what does deferred mean? It means you do not have to pay your monthly uh, loan amount. Um, this is what happens when I, not I forget to put water. Um, I, I forgot to bring water on this call and uh, I need water. Um, but nevertheless, it's, um, you have until 12 months, you have after 12 months where you can pay it. There is no prepayment penalty. The only thing to consider is if you defer the loan after you accept it for 12 months, which is beautiful, right? You don't have to pay it. Interest will still accrue at the 3.75 or 2.75%. So something to consider. For the PPP, you can defer it up to six months, right? Um, and the interest will accrue on that. But you don't have to defer. It's just an option they're giving you. They're really trying to help businesses to say, look, you got this loan, whether it's forgiven or not, you don't have to pay us right now until you get up on your feet and then you can start paying. It won't change the amount of years for the term, right? And I'm not sure how they're going to calculate um, what's due and what's not the balloon portion at the end. So I don't want to get into that. But if you need it, use it. If you don't need it and you pay it off sooner, there is no payment penalty. And Nada, before you have any other questions, if I can just talk about the terms of, of the PPP. For any amounts not forgiven, which we will go over in a quick second, um, the loan term for that amount on the PPP loan specifically is up to two years and six months of that can be deferred. Like I said, the interest rate is actually 1%, uh, which is crazy. It was at originally the program, they started what they wanted to do 4%, they went down to half percent, and then now it's fixed at 1% for those um, two years. And like I mentioned the note before I kind of jumped the gun is that the repayment may be deferred for a period of six months, but interest will accrue. Uh, any questions, Nadia, or maybe I've, I've answered some of them? Yeah, you might answer some of them with the next slide, but I think let's continue and... Okay, excellent. Um, so this should be a quick portion. Again, the loan use for a paycheck is really just for the paycheck protection part of it. Is uh, And I'll, I'll go into the differences in the percentage of how this can be used, but it's mainly for your payroll, for your rent, for your utilities and related benefits. And then also for the interest on your mortgage payment, not your principal, which is excluded if you actually are owner of that property of your business. Okay, um, not eligible for this forgiveness. 
is like I mentioned before, any employee cash equivalent compensation over $100,000. Compensation of employees whose principal place of residence is not uh, in the US. And then certain sick and family leave uh, for which credit is not allowed. Um, so those are not eligible. But again, if you're not sure, um, work with your lender, whoever you're working with to determine it. Um, and as long as you submit and your numbers are true, um, then they can make a determination with that too. The one thing I wanna do mention on these loans with all these waivers that the SBA has given, uh, the one thing that I mentioned consistently is you as the borrower are certifying that everything is true and correct. Okay, and you're doing this in good faith. So whatever, is, and they're not gonna put the onus on the lender, they're actually gonna come to you if you only have you know, one employee or if your numbers are off or for, for whatever reason it may be. So just make sure that before you present your numbers to the bank, to the lender, whatever it may be, that are they're true and accurate, um, you know, as far as you know, um, because you are the one who's ultimately responsible and they actually keep emphasizing that. Yeah, one of the questions was, what if I don't use um, the money for payroll? So ultimately, Is sorry? That, go ahead, I interrupted you actually, say that again. Oh, no, I, I actually cut you off because I think there was a, a lag in our um, communication. Um, Ask me that question again, please. What if they don't use the money for payroll? Okay, so I'll go over that in um, after I, well, let me go over that in the part where I do the breakdown of the percentages. Um, and then I'll also go over the seasonal borrower at that time too. So some of the documents that may be required, and we broke this to the best of our Ability, we try to break this down between the businesses and nonprofits with employees for documentation that may be required and those that absolutely will be required, and then the 1099 ones. So, for businesses and nonprofits, and you'll see um, some similarities, and um, you know, some of these will mirror each other. But the SBA PPP loan application, actually, let me see if I can just show that for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, so, this is uh, Nadia, could you see that? Yes. Okay, so this is the most updated version of the Paycheck Protection Program. This came out on April 3rd. Actually, from what you can see here, even on the original application, before independent contractors could submit, they still ask if you're a sole prop, if you're an independent contractor, um, you know, nonprofit, which type of corporation, and so forth. And then the application itself is actually, you know, pretty easy to do, and it does have some information for you. It's uh, easy to complete. The most important number. Uh, is the amount of, excuse me, average monthly payroll, multiply that by two and a half times, plus your idle loan that's going to be used for the same purpose that you can refinance into this loan, and then subtract the cash advance up to that $10,000 from this total amount, your total number of employees. And I understand I'm going a little fast here, but I just want to give you some background. And then if there's a more than 20% ownership uh, by any individual in the company, you have to list them as well. If the question is, what if I have more than two, then you need to add a separate sheet um, with their information and submit it with the loan, okay? But if this is the application, something worth noting is that some institutions have taken this application and you know made it into the digital version that you fill out online. So it really doesn't matter because they won't be submitting it without you certifying the information as it's uh, required on this form, okay? Let me go back. Okay, Nadia, could you see this? I'm back on the slides. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so some entity documents may be required. Uh, your driver license copy, again, all owners, 20% or more. I suggest you make colored copies, very clear of those uh, driver license numbers, driver licenses. Um, payroll reports for up to 12 months. Uh, again, this is to use to calculate the monthly uh, payroll and uh, annually each employee is capped for the cash equivalent at $100,000. Uh, breakdown of payroll benefits, if it applies. Uh, they may ask for 2018 and 19 business tax returns. If the question is, what if I don't have 2019 business tax returns, what do I do? They may ask for other type of financial statements, PNL, um, other documentations. Uh, this is the time I'll uh, take here to kind of explain a couple things. Uh, some questions without going into too much detail. But let's say you started your business in December, so obviously you don't have anything from 2019. How would you do it? You would take December, January, February, March, whatever it is, divided by those number of months, and that's what your monthly average would be. 
and this in, this is also the same for independent contractors and self-employed as we understand it and uh, if you're a seasonal employee and actually i'll take this directly from them if you are a seasonal employee and what does that mean is if you claim well look you know um i worked last year only between say february 15th and march 1st through june 30th and that is my season so they'll take that and then average that to use um, for this purpose or if you don't have that and your season is different but you're impacted by this They'll take January and February and then divide those two months to come to a monthly average. So there are ways to get around this. Um, well, not get around this, but those are their rules. Uh, however, that part will be reviewed um, and you get met for the questions to um, provide proof that you were a seasonal employee, to provide proof that, in fact, why you should only count uh, January and February and you know not 2019 if it didn't apply. So just remember, everybody, everything is based on proof. It's not just a matter of, Yes, I did it. This is how much I made. Um, I wrote on a piece of paper and now give me my loan. Um, just remember, you're dealing with the SBA and these are their type of loans. They have access to a lot of information um, and they will be requiring proof for everything that you claim. So that's the seasonal um, portion. Possibly they may require mortgage or lease documents if it applies. Last three months of utilities. Um, Bond, correct me if I'm wrong. They also want Form 940 and 941. Uh, quarterly and even up to um, March 31st and February 15th if it applies to you if you have payroll and those are payroll specific documents um, is that correct Bahan as you understand it I just want to make sure I don't have the numbers wrong on those payroll forms uh, correct you know it's as they say the the devil is in the details actually I've seen different banks approach it a little bit differently some of them base it on the 2019 payroll some of them do it based on the last 12 months there's also uh, an adjustment they do for payroll taxes for they call it a covered period which is from february 15th until most recent payroll somehow they with they deduct the uh, payroll taxes from the calculation so depending on the actual bank's approach they may um, request a variation of those documents but for sure 940 and the, the quarterly 941s and also if you have the most recent quarters 941 they'll ask for that too okay <clears throat> um if anybody is hearing any feedback or side conversations please uh send you can put in a question form and it let uh, not and no please um so we can try to fix any technical difficulties that may be happening and i apologize for that um, I received a message that that may have been nothing wrong, but you know, if it's uh, interrupting or, or, um, this program, just let us know and we'll try to fix it or mute it. All right, thank you, Vaughn. I appreciate that. Um, I always say, and like I mentioned before, uh, not to any of this to be considered advi advice, but uh, I'm not definitely I'm not a tax expert, so um, you know, I, and that's why we have Vaughn here. So I appreciate the input. So those are some of the documentations that may be required. Uh, just again, note that each lender institution may require more or less documents, right? So if you're working with someone and they say, I want more, I mean, I, I wouldn't argue with them to say, you know, I was in a thing and Haru told me you only need that. Why do you need that? Don't mention any of, of this. Um, and the thing to note is the reason they may want more or less because ultimately they're the ones who are gonna fund you the money. So they wanna make sure, you know, that they're giving it to somebody who they see qualifies for a particular amount. It's not that they're trying to deny you, they just need further justification on these forms. All right, hope that helps. Speaking of taxes, Haru, now that we were talking about it, um, so the forgivable portion of both of these loans, are they taxable? And if so, um, in the year uh, they are deemed forgiven, in the year received in, or in the year they are deemed forgiven, does that take place? So Vaughn, feel free to chime in, but uh, when I was on one of those calls, or many of them, they they actually said these uh, the forgive the forgiven portion, of course. So let's be clear on that. The forgiven portion is not taxable, um, and that is the only information I have that I that I will share. Unless Vahan, you have anything extra you want to um, chime in on? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. There's a provision in the CARES Act that said if the, those loans are forgiven. Uh, you know, typically you would have to include them in income, but in this case, uh, they're excluding it. So you don't, so kind of get a double benefit out of it. You don't have to report the income for the forgi forgiven amount. 
yeah, like I said, these are, um, you know, it, it, it goes good with the bad, right? These aren't good times, but hopefully uh, those of us that have been impacted and those that have businesses and employees especially um, do take advantage of these. Uh, you'd be amazed as, as, as much of a hot topic this is. This is um, a lot of people may still not be aware of what's available to them in their community. So uh, please do share. And the portion, um, I'll go that toward the end actually. Uh, okay, so for the 1099, and again, I, I, I understand there's a majority of the questions, not just for us, but uh, any of these that we've done do, or the questions I personally received, uh, do uh, kind of center around the 1099 or the independent contractor folks and so forth, and I, and I understand why, um, but they're still not extremely clear about it. So you, you also need to use the same application that I shared with you. Um, I wouldn't be concerned about the entity documents, for example. Uh, maybe there may be exceptions uh, or wild cards out there, but um, if you qualify under that, your lender will definitely ask you for it or whoever you're working with. You will also need your driver license company. If you do have it, your taxes, uh, business tax returns and financial statements may be required, most likely will. Um, you may be it uh, somebody who received 1099, but also has a mortgage or lease, right? So those documents would uh, need to be um, furnished. Last three months of utilities. Uh, again, if you have a place you're renting, there was a question about, well, what if my house is my business? Um, and I think the answer I heard was, you know, if, if you're claiming it on your taxes and it applies, um, then go ahead and, you know, go ahead and apply for it. And uh, so again, I mentioned what other documents you can use for 1099s is just think of it this way as how are you gonna provide the proof, um, you know, one, that you have suffered the economic injury uh, for these loans, and two, how are you gonna be able to provide the proof um, after the fact, or whether you were a seasonal employee and whatever, when you got paid, um, you know, who maybe you worked with and so forth. So um, you can have supporting documentation, income and tax, uh, income and expense documents, uh, bank records definitely to demonstrate deposits, cancel checks, et cetera. So it really falls in the proof, and you are the one who, are, who is, again, as the borrower, who is certifying this information. So the more proof you can provide, the better. In fact, uh, on yesterday evening's um, meeting, uh, there was a lot of discussion, both for IDLE and PPP. And again, these are just suggestions. You run your business however you want to and handle your you know, uh, financial affairs. But there was even suggestion that particularly for these loans and this, anything that's gonna be forgiven, you keep a very tight record, maybe even have a separate bank account um, that you're keeping because when the time comes to ask for the forgiveness or whatever you're doing, it's very clear um, what happened with these, you know, how you used it, when you used it, and so forth, and it'll be less of a headache for you when you apply. Um, so that's that's that. And there will be a little more information on 1099s, but I'll, I'll provide it toward the end of the slide, I think. Uh, for the key points, again, I said must apply with the lender servicing the PPP. This pertains to loan forgiveness. So this is kind of one of the final points that has not been very clear. It's not very clear. And here's the reason, the way they explained it. They said, look, we got 60 days or more before the first you know, person, entity, a business is going to try to ask for forgiveness. And in this current environment we're living in, that's a lifetime. So they have some information but they're confident that more information will come out. Um, maybe they'll be more clear on what it is that you actually need to have these loans forgiven. But we've taken some of the general information they provided and we wanna share with you because if you can, if you already received it or applied, it's good to start prepping for it or just as an FYI. So the loan forgiveness, who do you apply to the loan with? Again, PPP has to go through a lender, not the SBA. So whoever you restart, whoever is gonna be servicing your loan right, or completed your loan or you went through, even if it was a third party, they submitted to somebody, you will know who that somebody was because they also would have contacted you directly. You must submit all the documentation to them, apply for your uh, loan forgiveness through them. Some documentations, we kind of already went over this, employee payroll, pay rates, uh, payments, uncovered mortgage obligations, leases. Um, so anything you could provide proof, uh, you know, will, will assist you. How much of the PPP loan can be forgiven? Up to 100%, uh, and I'll give a little more information on this. 75% of the loan you receive for PPP must be applied toward eligibility um, for uh, payroll costs. 25% may apply for non-business costs, right? 
So, and you have eight weeks to spend this until June 30th. So some questions come up. I think one was earlier. What if, you know, I don't use this for payroll, then that, that's fine. What if I use, uh, you know, less than 75, that's okay. And what I'll, by okay, I mean, it'll turn into a loan, not a forgiveness. What I'm talking about is if you use 75% of the loan you receive from PPP by June 30th and 25% of that loan, right? And again, this can be 90 and 10, as long as it's 75% minimum that you apply toward payroll costs and up to 25% of non-payroll costs by June 30th. So you have to get the money, spend it by then, by spend it, meaning give it to your employees, whatever you're going to do, um, and then have proof it will be forgiven or it should be forgiven. Whatever it is not, I think there was a question, what if I get it and I say, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to rehire folks or whatever. Um, I don't think there's any criminal or civil penalty for doing that, but it'll just turn into a, um, a loan, a loan for two years for 1%. It's still ultimately to help you, right? So there's no wrongdoing in that. It's because you need it. You're applying for it. Good for you. You got it, but just know it's going to be a loan, not forgiven. Uh, other things to consider is what they want to stay away from, you know, if you had 10 employees and then let's say you laid off a few or, you know, you're not working right, they're not working right now, you get this loan and then you don't hire, not necessarily the individuals because it's not tied to the individual, it's tied to the, um, tied to the dollar amount. If you don't rehire within, you know, for that dollar amount to refill those positions and if you don't continue paying um, the employees that you may have not been paying and you can't provide proof, you can't just pocket that, write a letter and saying, I used it for payroll, you know, please forgive my loan. And if there's a differentiation, uh, the dif if there's a difference between, um, let's say before you applied, you had 40 employees at the time you're asking for forgiveness and between that period, you had 30, you know, that's something they're going to wait to figure, you know, well, you know, what changed here? Um, they may not forgive all of it. That calculation is not very clear. But the takeaway here is you have to apply it toward your payroll, your business, and it must be a minimum of 75 and 25 ratio. And if it's not, that's okay in the sense that it just becomes a regular loan for two years at 1% with six months uh, deferred. Okay. Anything not uh, worth you know touching yeah, on that maybe I have um, Do you want to get into the EDD um, topic later on or do you want to maybe go over? Um... I, will, I will just touch on that, right? I was going to do it later, but I might as well do it now. So okay. um, CARES Act actually has a, a portion in there that addresses EDD. And um, again, this is not advice in any way. I don't work for the EDD, I don't know, but it's just information that has been presented is, um, and from what's out there. Uh, as we understand it, currently independent contractors, self-employed are actually allowed, at least in California, I can't speak for every state, each state, and I know some of you are calling in from different states, um, each state, I advise that you check with your own office. Um, however, in California, as I understand it, the way it's been explained is you, the independent contractor uh, or self-employed 1099 person can apply for EDD benefits, right? And the reason they've mentioned this is because um, some of the, ten, you know, I apologize, I, I keep referring uh, to those as 1099, but some of these people have, were concerned that what if I don't get P, uh, the PPP loan? What if I can get a certain amount? Um, what if it takes too long? So you should call your EDD office and find out what you can apply for. As I understand it, you can use both concurrently, but the scenario may be with the way they explained it is you may qualify, um, you may be eligible to receive unemployment, and let's say you get unemployment up to a point where you receive your PPP, then you would have to probably notify, right, because you can't receive both because at this time you're receiving income, I guess, if you're an individual. And then you may be able to apply after again if you're still impacted and the amount for your PPP forgiveness portion or loan or whatever it is runs out. Um, it's worth noting because I think that's very useful information, especially to those individuals who may need it. But again, for those of you, and I know there's quite a few who are out of state, um, check with your own state. This is not a national you know, uh, blanket rule. It's just there's funding in there, part of the CARES Act, and this is actually an exception. Um, I, you know, for the, from what I've heard, and, and I'm not an independent contractor, but from what I've heard for those before, and I think Nada, you mentioned this too, before you couldn't apply for unemployment, but I'm saying now you can, however, you should contact your EDD sooner than later. Did that cover that question, Nada? Is that what you were referring to? 
Um, I believe so. And how, what what do we do in what does one do in terms of if they're an independent contractor but they don't have a business checking account? How do they prove to that they are um, the pay you know as a payroll to themselves? They their payroll is essentially the only thing they have on that application. So how do they prove that they don't have the checking account? So the similar question has come up before, so and I. Question has come up before. So, so Brian, did you want to say something about that? Because I. No, okay. Um, um, I think in this case, uh, it's really net earnings from self-employment. So as a sole pro uh, as a sole proprietor, um, you know, sole proprietors don't do payroll, don't pay payroll to themselves. Um, it's just whatever is left after all the expenses and deductions. So it's really self, net self-employment income or net income, net earnings from self-employment is what the technical term is. That would be the amount of, so to speak, payroll to use. Yeah, actually, thank you for mentioning that. The net amount, as they mentioned it, um, for the checking or business account, if you know what, Ultimately, uh, the way they explained it is just the proof, right? Is even if it's not a checking account, um, a business, but it's a personal, um, and if, if you have the proof of the documentation, then that's the proof you need to provide. You can only provide what you have, is the bottom line. And uh, kind of hand them what you have and, and let them um, ask you either for more information uh, or grant or deny on the basis they are going to do so. So there's no okay. clear rule to answer that question in another way. There is no rule that clearly says you must have you know, a business checking account if, if you have, uh, in the, if you are an independent contractor. Um, and also, what if they're not registered as an official business? I think we might have touched upon the fact that it's not necessary for independent contractors, correct? Correct, and I think correct. Bahan touched on that also. Um, yeah, same thing. If uh, you can do business just by yourself, uh, you know, as the person being the legal entity, um, and you don't have to have a DBA, uh, even an EIN, so you can just use your social security number and um, your own personal bank account. Not that it's recommended, but you know there are a lot of small businesses who just use their own personal bank account and do it under their own name. So what, com what it comes down to is, again, what you report on your tax return as net income. Uh, as a Schedule C is for businesses uh, that are so proprietors. So, and, and you would have a profit and loss statement which shows your total income and then all your deductions and what's left. And as Harold mentioned, it's really about providing proof. So, if you made all those deposits into your personal bank account, that's fine. You're going to just print your bank statements and highlight those deposits and say, those deposits were for basically for my business. Great. Thanks, Baha. Thank you. Uh, Nara, did you have any other questions? uh the next one we're going to go to um do you before i move forward um we can always come at in the general q a that's okay yeah we can cover uh, it in the general q a okay uh Vaughan, if i can um, pass this over to you as i think the next slide um uh, pertains to you so take it over my friend sure thank you john okay so there were a, a number of tax provisions in the cares act um and uh, I just want to go over some of the major ones, the most popular ones. Um, so the very first one was a big relief for everyone and including, you know, tax preparers uh, and everyone out there is the extension of the deadline. So um, all the deadlines that were March 15th, April 15th, and just about a couple days ago, they said all the deadlines up until June 15th will be extended until July 15. And so this is not just an extension to file, but it's also an extension to pay, which is really good. It also includes the first and second quarter estimated tax payments, which were usually due by April 15th and June 15th. Now those are also due by July 15th. Um, so uh, there's some planning needed there. Uh, you still wanna be ready when July 15th comes and you have tax payments to make. Um, you wanna be ready for that. So those, they don't go away. It's just a diff, you know, an, an extension of the deadline. And for those who need further extensions, you can get your typical extensions. Um, for businesses, you get until 
September 15th and for individuals until October 15th. You, but you do have to file actual extensions by the July 15th deadline. Um, and another popular uh, provision was the, you know, the stimulus payments or uh, recovery rebates. Uh, those are uh, technically credits, advanced, they're advances against credits that you're going to claim on your next year's tax returns, but you're going to get them now. The IRS is starting to process those payments. Um, and uh, the, the amounts will be $1,200 for uh, uh, for uh, individuals, for uh, married couples, it's going to be 1,200 each, so 2,400. For dependents, it's 500 each, um, and unfortunately, they they don't count as dependents. Anybody older than 18 years, so it's really for um, uh, dependents under under 18 years, uh, under 17 years, actually. Uh, so you get 1,200 for each uh, parent, basically, and then uh, 500 for each uh, child. And there are limits to the income. So if anybody's income, if they're single, um, above 75,000, uh, and for uh, couples above 150,000, it starts to phase phase out. So if your income is above 100,000 and you're single, then you don't get anything. And if your income is above 200,000, you're married couple, you don't get anything. Um, and anything between, uh, you get a kind of a reduced amount. Um, another provision, if uh, for, for those who are affected by the virus, uh, either uh, health-wise or financial-wise, and they really need uh, need funds and they can't get, uh, you know, loans or anything, they, they can access their uh, retirement plans um, and they you know when you when you take an early withdrawal from your retirement plan typically there is a 10 percent penalty so the IRS is waiving this penalty if you need if you need uh, to take the money out for for hardship currently uh, this applies to withdrawals this year and so you don't have to pay the 10 percent penalty um, and also um, and you can also get a loan from the retirement plan and paid back within three years. Um, so, and and if you just take a permanent withdrawal, not a loan, uh, you can recognize the income over the next uh, three years, uh, as opposed to typically you would have to recognize the income and pay the penalty in the current year, but now you don't have to pay a penalty and you can recognize the income and pay the tax on it over the next three years. Um, charitable, Contributions uh, typically uh, you're able to deduct them if you're itemizing, uh, if you're claiming itemized deductions. Now um, they they give this uh, opportunity to donate up to three hundred dollars uh, and and to be able to deduct uh, the three hundred dollars even without itemizing. So if you're taking the standard deduction, you're still able to claim uh, a deduction of up to three hundred dollars. Now this is going to be a, a, be applicable for 2020 tax returns. So this is, we're speaking next year. Another benefit is if the employer pays uh, for the employee's um, student loan, and it has to be the employee's student loan, not a family member's, for up to $5,250, um, they can, the employer can take a deduction and it's not taxable income to the employee. So it's kind of, you know, some tax free money uh, to the employee would be a helpful benefit if, if some of the companies out there uh, do this. Um, another good provision is net operating loss carry bags. Um, in the past, we used to be able to uh, carry back losses. So if a business has uh, income a few successful years and you pay taxes and then you have a bad year, um, you, in the past, you were able to carry back those losses and claim some refunds. Now, with the tax reform, uh, uh, you know, starting 2018, you couldn't carry back those losses. Now, with the CARES Act, they're saying, actually, you can go back. If you had losses in your 2018 return, on your 2018 return, you can actually carry, the, carry them back for five years. Um, now, same for 2019. Um, in 2020. Now, a lot of us may have losses in 2020, so we can carry those back. And if, for those of you who had losses in 2018 and couldn't carry back, now you can go back and, uh, and, and file amended returns or file a claim of refund and, and get some money back from the government. 
Um, other benefits out there are, there are three payroll tax credit benefits for businesses. Um, you know, if a business uh, has to provide paid family leave or sick leave to those employees who were affected um, by the virus or who are taking care of someone sick, or even if, if their children's school is closed and, and they have to stay home and look after the children and cannot work, if the employer is paying them uh, still their payroll, um, there is a credit they can claim. It's a dollar for dollar credit. There's a cap uh, for sick leave. It's $511 per day and uh, it's up to two weeks. Um, and for uh, you know family leave, uh, it could go up to eight or 10 weeks. Uh, so the employer gets a credit uh, from the government, which is a reduction to their payroll taxes. Um, another one for businesses is uh, the employee retention credit. So if you if it's a if a business had to close doors or if their revenue uh, drops, you know, 50 percent, less than 50 percent of what it was uh, in the same quarter of last year, um, but they still pay the employees they can get a credit again, uh, and it's up to 50% um, of wages for a, per uh, employee up to $10,000 of wages, which is up to $5,000 in actual tax credit. And um, another one, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, businesses can also defer their payroll taxes uh, for two years. So they can pay the, that's the social security part of it, they can pay half next year and half with two years from now. There are some ordering rules, which one you can use uh, in combination. And also, um, I, I think I've heard if you get the PPP loan, you may not take advantage of uh, one or two of those credits. Um, so you wanna be careful uh, which, uh, which, is the, which gives you the best benefit before you know, using those um, uh, features. Now, um, there, there's another one that uh, it's called the qual Qualified Improvement Property. Um, uh, you know, typically large improvements to um, you know, leasehold improvements uh, to interior buildings, part of the buildings. Uh, you, you, you would have to capitalize and depreciate over a long period of time, you know, 39 years. Um, and that's a small benefit each year. Now, what they did, uh, they al they're allowing you to depreciate those over 15 years, which in turn lets you take a, a bonus. So uh, you can actually take 100% uh, deduction for uh, for any of your leasehold improvements. Now, um, this, this was pretty generic and, and high level and the act just came out. Um, we're still waiting for detailed um, regulations to come out. So, so this was, really kind of just what we were able to absorb in, in a short period of time. Again, as Howard mentioned, you know, uh, none of it is really meant to be tax advice. It's just for educational purposes or just let you know that those things are available. And there are some other tax provisions which were, weren't that popular or applicable. So um, I haven't mentioned about those. Um, it's pretty much what I have about taxes. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Vaughn. Um, uh, Hara, do you want to, do you have any other points you want to cover? Or do you want to go over some of these questions that we have? Yeah, actually, we've been, uh, yeah, actually we've been trying uh, to respond um, to the questions uh, as we can, and especially if we had already gone over it. I'll go over a couple of these before, so everybody could hear it, but before I do, these are some of the resources and links we will share with you. Um, I do understand most of you uh, may already know these links, may have gone through it. Some of you may have not. It may be difficult to navigate through these, but again, nevertheless, we will share it. If you don't have it, you can uh, apply. Uh, we put a general email, by general, I mean one of the organization emails up here um, that you can apply, not apply, send your email to. Um, so send an email to this email. So this way we know that you do need and you are asking for these resources to be um, emailed to you. And then we will use that list and that email to respond uh, to the group uh, requesting these resources. Okay. Uh, there was a question I think somebody has. I actually answered and then um, 
I forgot. I think they rep re repeated this, but may, may be an important point. If I'm just a sole, would I be uh, counted as employee, uh, one employee? And I, uh, the answer was yes. May I apply for both the EIDL and PPP? Uh, again, the answer is yes. You just can't use it for the same purpose. Um, what if I didn't file a 2019 tax and I had 2018 or 2020? Um, again, they may not only may they ask for 2018, but uh, they may also ask you to provide a profit and loss or other income uh, expense documentation uh, for 2019. And also one thing, uh, you know, that they were mentioning was, you know, you also may want to include up to March 2020 for the reason because you may have hired um, employees in March 2020. So you want to be able to claim that because the period of injury is after that point, not in 2019. And that's another point that was worth making is that questions have come up. Well, you know, if I'm doing fine right now, but, you know, it wasn't good in 2019, these loans are not there to help you for something that happened before the pandemic. These loans are in place to have to help you for something during and after the pandemic. Um, so that may be worth noting. Uh, there was another good question here. Um, and if anybody has a question, go ahead and submit. There's actually quite a few I got to go through. So there is no pay prepayment penalty for either the idle or PPP if you were to pay um, sooner. I am not working with Chase Bank. Um, and so I would ask you that you deal directly with them. I'm trying to find the ones that probably aren't du duplicate. I, I apologize. Um, we have a question, Harut, I'm not sure if you saw this one. On a PPP application, is the spouse considered a more than 20% owner of a self-employed person's business due to, due to the community property laws in California? Vaughn, you can answer this. I, I, I could only give an opinion for the way they're asking for payroll is, um, you know, is she or he receiving um, checks, income, payroll, anything uh, pertaining to that company? Or is the question where she has nothing to do with the business and you're just inquiring about community property? If that's the case, I would think not, but unless Fahan has more information specific to um, from the tax angle of that. Um, I, there really isn't anything on, on that topic. Um, I mean, what if a husband, wife or spouses, they each have a business? Um, I really don't know. I, I probably wouldn't disclose because um, you're really the person doing the business, even even if we're in a community property state um, and each spouse may apply. And I probably would not put the other spouse as a 20% owner. That's my personal opinion. Okay, uh, thank you, Vaughn. I will answer this one question that I, uh, and then I, and then I think we can um, maybe end it, Nada, if you're okay, because as I understand, maybe some services or other things may have started, people may want to participate. Um, what if certain employees don't want to come back? Uh, can we hire new employees in their place? Will the loan cover new employee hires? I think I kind of had answered that before. Um, and the way that they had answered that was, they want you to retain, not the individual, right? But they want you to re retain the dollar amount and that's how they would consider the 75%. So if somebody doesn't wanna come back, but you refilled that position with somebody else. And again, I'm uh, kind of relaying the information that was provided. That's the explanation um, they gave. And, uh, and I hope that makes sense. So, you know, you don't have to run and beg somebody to come back if they don't want to or force them, I should say. Uh, but as long as you refill that position uh, for that particular dollar amount, and then when you apply for longer forgiveness, um, then it should apply. Okay. Uh, for anything we did not go through, we will review it. If we can somehow um, submit, if there are any really uh, other questions, we will. If not, please go ahead and use that email to send um, your inquiry to receive these resources. And then, um, you know, we'll go from there. We really appreciate everyone coming on. Thank you all very much. Uh, wishing everyone a happy Easter and a great weekend. And uh, Nade or Vahan, do you have any uh, final words? Well, thank you everyone for, for being with us. Happy Easter, stay well and safe. And yes, thank you Harut, Yadalian and Vahan Papian for joining us today. The information presented was extremely informative and helpful. And I'm pretty sure everyone uh, participating probably agrees as well. 
And thank you for everyone for participating in today's webinar. I hope um, you guys can make use of the information that we provided. Feel free to share with your family, your friends, your colleagues. Um, we're really just doing this to help our community. So as long as we can provide some guidance, then um, that is our goal. And lastly, I'd like to thank the organizations that were a part of this. Um, we appreciate the support and um, it's nice that we can come together and work on something like this for our community. Um, as Harut mentioned, please go ahead and send an email to alea at aesa.org if you want the resources to be sent to you, including those links that he was showing to you earlier, as well as the slides. And we're happy to share anything that may be useful to you. And if you'd like to be a part of any of the organizations that um, organize this event, or if you'd like to know about upcoming events, we do organize um, business seminars and different types of events that we hope are helpful for the community. So you can either find these organizations on our Facebook event page, or feel free to email us and we're happy to connect you with anyone that you would like to be connected to. And lastly, I would just like to point out that this is a very difficult time for a lot of businesses and a lot of people in general. Um, so if I can just encourage everyone to do one act of kindness in their community, then that would be, um, I think, really helpful. And uh, I think we have to come together at this time. So stay safe and keep quarantined. And with that, we'll be concluding Thank you, the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Happy Easter.